introduction. Uh, I had to admit that uh, when I was invited to present to the Royal Geographical Society of South Australia, um, I was a little bit nonplussed as to what I could talk to you about. My background was in paleontology and what geographical kind of subject matter could I come up with? And there was a loose end out of my PhD, which I thought would make a suitable subject uh, for this discussion tonight. And as we go along, I think it should become apparent to you that because of the stimulus of having to put this presentation together this evening, I've actually opened up a whole new avenue of research for myself. Um, if any of you know of a funding source that wants to back me to go to Vanuatu and New Caledonia and Fiji and follow up on this, I'll be most interested in making contact with that group. The problem that I had with my in my PhD uh, that led to tonight's discussion is that I was finding little crocodiles at a site called Riversley in northwest Queensland, and these were obligate terrestrial crocodiles. There were features of the skeleton that suggested they were not living in water, they were not aquatic, they were actually terrestrial predators. We've seen this occur many other times overseas in the history of crocodiles. And these were occurring in Riversley about 20 million years ago. And then we next see them in the fossil record in New Caledonia in sites that are only about 4,000 years old. What's going on? How did this obligate terrestrial crocodile <coughs> make it across from Australia to New Caledonia? And then the plot thickened, because these crocodiles started turning up in Vanuatu. And a, very, uh, a couple of sites in Vanuatu, and um, a very closely related species started to turn up in Fiji. So something was going on somehow, these crocodiles that could not simply swim across these distances, across open oceans, were spreading across the South Pacific. Then there was a similar pattern among a group of turtles called the Myelanids, which we first see in Australia, uh, in actually in the Northern Territory, which is just off the edge of this map, um, back in the, the, the early Miocene, so about 20 odd million years ago. Uh, we see them in more recent deposits, Pleistocene deposits in Australia. And then we see them on Lord Howe Island in very recent deposits, perhaps less than 10,000 years old, certainly less than 100,000 years ago. Uh, we find them in New Caledonia, and they started to turn up in Vanuatu and in Fiji. So something was going on that allowed these creatures to be able to cross these oceanic barriers. And by and large, it was a case of, in academic circles, it was, well, maybe they drafted across, you know, and no one really paid any attention to the details of what that implied. Up until 2010, and that's when a friend of mine, uh, or a couple of colleagues of mine, put out a paper because they realised that there was something suspicious about the finds in Vanuatu and Fiji. And that was that both of the, uh, the crocodile and the turtle were turning up in middens and only in the base of middens. Now, what we thought was the case was that these turtles and crocodiles had made it to Vanuatu before people had got there. And the reason why they're only in the base of the middens is because the, when people arrived, they ate them into extinction. And in fact, I even did a story on Catalyst on that very principle, eating into extinction. Um, so yeah, that's the story in uh, Vanuatu, that's the story in Fiji, uh, and these are the sorts of bits and pieces of turtles at the top and the crocodiles at the bottom that they were turning up in the middens. But in 2010, uh, what my colleagues came up with was they pointed out that the currents 
between Vanuatu and New Caledonia flow in this direction. And so they could, the creatures couldn't have originally rafted from New Caledonia to Vanuatu. And what they think happened was that the Lapita people, the first people to populate the Southwest Pacific, and they are uh, renowned for their really exquisite uh, pottery, that they were picking up these crocodiles from New Caledonia uh, and these turtles from New Caledonia, and they were transporting them as food sources, and that's how they spread to Vanuatu and onto Fiji. That's exactly the way that um, uh, European mariners treated large turtle uh, tortoises on a number of islands in the southwest Pacific, uh, in the south, uh, in, in the ocean and also uh, in the uh, South Pacific. That still leaves the problem of how did they get from Australia to New Caledonia? It's a distance of about 1,400 kilometres. It's a very long way. And today, the currents are still in the wrong direction. So that has become the focus of my investigation that has been triggered by pulling together this talk tonight. So let's meet, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, also we need to account for how we can get a, uh, a turtle across to Lord Howe Island. Um, so, uh, with the current going in the wrong direction. I'm just getting ahead of myself there. So let's meet the players here. The crocodile that we're talking about is a, a small crocodile called Mikosuchus. Uh, it's an extinct genus of Australian crocodiles uh, within a, a subfamily called the Mikosuchinae. Um, they are rather cute little fellas. They've got a little box-like heads. Some of the distinctive features are that the teeth are actually in a, a ridge around the sides of the mouth. The, this bone here, called the maxilla, which contains the teeth in the upper jaw, actually participates in the orbit. That's a very unusual feature for a crocodile. Mm -hmm. Normally in a crocodile, the jugal, this bone here, will contact the lacrimal here, excluding the maxilla from the orbit. So it's a very unusual feature. Small box-like heads, and the jaw has this kind of stepped nature, which again is very unusual for a crocodile. So these quite distinctive crocodiles, uh, they were only small, maximum two metres. In fact, most of them were probably only one and a half metres from the tip of their nose to the end of their tail as adults. Um, uh, they would look something like this. Um, we have reason to believe that they would have had a, 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 an upright gait. I can explain that a little bit later when we look at uh, some of the limb elements. Um, and there are four species of Mikosuchus. Can you all hear me without this? <coughs> Excellent, because that really annoys me. <laughs> uh, there's four species of Mikosuchus. Mikosuchus white hunterensis. Uh, this is one of the species that I named. Um, that's found, uh, it's the oldest uh, member of uh, Mikosuchus. It's found in deposits uh, at Riversley, the late Oligocene in age, so about 23 million years old. Um, it's known from a variety of bits and pieces. Again, you can see the step jaw here. Uh, this is the one with the orbit in the maxilla. Uh, there's the alveolar uh, ridge with the, with, with the teeth in, in it. Um, a second species from a slightly younger deposit at Riversley, which I also named Mikosuchus sanderi. Uh, and this is the known from a cranial table, but also from a maxilla. And again, the maxilla has this portion here where it participates in the orbit. So there's no question this is the same genus, even though it's a different species. And they have small box-like heads. I'll keep coming back to that feature, and the significance will become apparent later on. Um, then there's Mikosuchus inexpectatus, <laughs> which was named by a Frenchman, so I'm not taking any responsibility. Uh, inexpectatus because it was unexpected to find such a creature in New Caledonia. Um, and uh, it's now known from a couple of sites in New Caledonia. 
It's uh, probably one of the larger of the Miko Sukines. This guy would be getting up to the one, uh, one and a half to two meter in the total length. Um, there's the step jaw that I was talking about. And it was actually suggested that the point of this step jaw and the crushing teeth at the back here was that they were specialised in crushing mollusks. Mycosuchus and expectatus. Then we have Mycosuchus calpacase, which is the species that turns up in the middens on uh, in Vanuatu. Uh, and again, um, there is a portion here where the maxilla participates in the orbit. There's no question this is Mycosuchus. Very recent deposits, less than 3,000 years old. So, you know, um, around about the time that they were building Stonehenge, this guy was alive and well, <laughs> or rather was being eaten into extinction uh, in Vanuatu. Um, the Crocodile in Fiji is an interesting beast. It's very close, it's a thing called Volia, and uh, it's very closely related to Mycosuchus. It's known from quite a, a, a nice assemblage of bits of bones. This is um, what's called the cranial table, so these are the orbits here. This is the, the, the brain, uh, the, the, the deck behind the eyes. Uh, these are the mandibles, uh, we put them all together and we get a skull, something like this, known from two sites in Fiji. Uh, now when we have a look at the phylogenetic system, actually, we have a look at the family tree, the history of these beasts. And again, the reason why I want to go into this in some detail now will become apparent a little later on. Um, if we reconstruct the, fa the family history, the oldest member of the group is Mycosuchus whitehunderensis. That's occurring back at the very late Oligocene, 23 million years ago. <coughs> then we get Mycosuchus sanderi, slightly younger deposits, maybe 17 to 20 million years old, uh, also at Riversley in northwest Queensland. Then we get Mycosuchus inexpectatus in New Caledonia, uh, in very, very recent deposits. Uh, then Mycosuchus calpacase in Vanuatu. Uh, we don't, ha we haven't actually done the analysis, but I suspect this is where it fits into the family tree. Very closely related to Mycosuchus inexpectatus, uh, and that is in Vanuatu. In very recent deposits there. If we go back down the family tree, the next species is Volio. So they're very, very closely related to each other. They probably diverged sometime within the Oligocene. So they last shared a common uh, ancestor hmm, 25 to 30 million years ago. And if you go back down the family tree even further, the next species or next genus of crocodile is a thing called Quincana. Quincana we know from a number of different species. Uh, in Aust they're all in Australia. It's a fully terrestrial crocodile. It's much larger than uh, Nikosuchus. We've got um, bits that suggest the average size was three to four meters in length. We've got one fragment, which if it's Quincana, suggests that it's over six and a half meters long. So a big terrestrial carnivore. Um, it didn't have a flattened skull like a typical crocodile. Its skull was arched up and dome-like, and its teeth were what we call xiphodont. They were compressed from side to side. They had serrated margins uh, on the leading and trailing edges. They were like steak knives. These, these, this is a condition called xiphodonty, and it's what we see in theropod or meat-eating dinosaurs. So there's no doubt that these guys were terrestrial predators, uh, and they were down on the land running around killing their prey down there. They spread back so that they split from Volia and Mycosuchus. Their last common ancestor was probably back in the late Eocene, going back 33, 34 million years ago. Now, other species of crocodiles <coughs> from Australia, fossil crocodiles that I dealt with in my PhD, 
We can literally bunch together in a, a group that we'll call the Palinarchians because the first member of that group to be described was a thing called Palinarchus. But it also includes things like uh, Australosuchus and Baru and um, uh, Harpaca, no, no, not Harpaca Kamsa. That comes in a bit later. But these crocodiles, uh, this group, all Australian and they spread back uh, we've got them going back, uh, Canberra is another one of these guys, going back almost to the Cretaceous, uh, back to the Paleocene, 56 million years ago. And when I completed my PhD, I had these all together in one group. This was the Mycosuchene. But subsequent work has shown that, in fact, the genus Crocodilus, we're familiar with Crocodilus, uh, porosis, the saltwater crocodile today. There's 21 species that are living of crocodilus. That is more uh, that they actually extend back to, uh, to an origin in Africa, uh, in the Miocene. Um, so again, about 15 to 17 million years ago, in the middle of the Miocene. And they are more closely related to the Palinarchines than either of them are to this group here. And just to make it more complicated, if we look in between those gaps, there are North American and eight, uh, North American species. Uh, then there's this weird thing that I just mentioned earlier, half pack of cancer from the Northern Territory. Um, so the biogeography of these guys starts to become a bit confused the further back in time that we go. And in fact, if we want to go back even further, we can find that um, th this whole group uh, is looking to uh, ancestors in North America and in Europe, Asiatosuchus germanicus, hence uh, that's from a number of sites in Germany, pr principally the Messel deposit near Darmstadt. I don't know if you've heard of them, but uh, I had the pleasure of working with those whilst I was in Bonn, wonderful creature. The take-home message here for tonight's talk, however, is just focus on this group here. And what this tells us is that they had an Australian origin and they have subsequently moved out into the South Pacific. That's the signal that is coming through from the phylogenetics from the family tree. Okay, the turtle that we're talking about, sorry, the tortoise that we're talking about, is a thing called Myelania. Um, it's known as, the, Myelania actually means little Roma, it's an extinct genus of stem turtle, that was a primitive turtle, uh, from the middle Miocene through to the late Pleistocene uh, and possibly the Holocene. Uh, so, sp uh, spanning back to uh, 15, 17 million years, right the way through to very, very recent deposits, uh, less than a few thousand years old. Um, uh, this is uh, one of the species, to give you some idea of the sort of beast that we're talking about. Um, it's an unusually shaped skull that has uh, a number of horns and protrusions on them, which prevents the skull from being retracted inside the shell. So these guys had their head outside of the shell all of the time. And the tail, similarly, uh, had a set of rings of bony armour forming a complete bony sheath because it couldn't be retracted into the shell for protection either. These things were sticking out and so they needed to be protected from predators. Um, in body form, it's kind of similar to um, ankylosaurid dinosaurs and things called glyptonods, which are mammals from the Americas. And these guys can get up to very, very large sizes. There's, um, there are specimens of glyptodonts that are the size of a VW, the beetle. Um, and originally they were thought to be aquatic because they were mainly found near, uh, near beaches. Then it was, it was a long period of time where we thought, no, actually they're terrestrial because their feet are not in paddles, they are definite feet, so that that's something you use for walking on land. 
rather than for swimming. Um, but then, as of last year, they've actually been shown to be aquatic herbivores. So they're living in freshwater systems uh, in, and eating plants. Um, there's a few species of myelania to consider. The oldest is a thing called myelania brevicolis, and that's from a site in the Northern Territory, mid Miocene site called the Canfield Beds. So we're going back to uh, about 17, uh, 15 to 17 million years old. Uh, we've got a fair collection of bones from the Canfield Beds, which gives us a good idea of what this beast was like. Um, these horns would have been on the skull uh, of uh, Myelania brevicolis. Uh, there is an unnamed species from the Wyandotte local fauna, which is Pleistocene in age. It's up here, just inland from Townsville, Cairns, up that way. Um, and what's significant about this is it's a very large beast. Um, we know about the horn cores and a few other bits and pieces that we can put together. When you put it all together, you're talking about a carapace that's over six feet across, uh, six feet long. Uh, that makes it the second largest terrestrial tortoise in the world. Uh, there is one larger in Asia, a thing called Megalochiles. <coughs> um, then you have Myelania mackayi, which was actually found, uh, it's, it's only a small species, 70 centimetres long, a carapace. Um, we know lots of bits and pieces from it. First found on Walpole Island, uh, which is down here off New Caledonia. Um, and we now have bits and pieces of this species from Pinda on New Caledonia and also from uh, Tiga Island, which is up in the Admiralty Group, <coughs> uh, just off the <coughs> northeast of New Caledonia. Then we have what is thought to be myelania, hence the question mark, uh, Damalippi, and that is the one that has been found in middens in Vanuatu. There's now five different locations for uh, this uh, particular species, and also in Fiji, where there are two locations for <laughs> myelania Damalippi. Then we have My uh, Myelania platyceps. This is the species from, New Cal uh, from uh, Lord Howe Island. It's a fairly large beast. We're talking about a carapace that's a metre to a metre and a half long. So again, a large beast. Um, and you can see all of the characteristics of Myelania in these beasts. These are probably the most complete skeletons we have of any Myelania. You can see the horny tail, you can see the head with the horns on it, uh, and the general layout of the beast there. Now, let's have another digression into the family tree. Um, really, we can go back beyond the genus Myelania to the group, the Myelanes, the, the, the more expanded group, the family that this, these guys uh, come from. Uh, there is a creature in Gladstone, Queensland. It hasn't been properly described yet. It's Middle Eocene in age, 35 million, something like 36 million years old. Um, then we have a, another genus, a thing called uh, Ninjinis, which occurs in the Pleistocene uh, of uh, Queensland. Uh, then we get to uh, the next. One in the, in the group is Wakalania, that comes from Riversley, uh, northwest Queensland, and that's dating to 23 million years, very latest Oligocene. Um, and then we get into Myelania, the genus itself. So the oldest is Myelania brevicolis, as I pointed out, that's from the Northern Territory. Then you've got the large, the extremely large version from the Wyandotte fauna. Um, then you have Myelania mackayi, which is the one from Walpole Island in near New Caledonia. Uh, and Myelania platyceps from Lord Howe Island. If you 
go back, uh, sorry, and then um, Myelania, Dame Lippi, uh, in Fiji and Vanuatu. Again, this hasn't been <coughs> properly plotted in. I suspect this is where it fits into the family tree. <coughs> Again, the signal to take home, the important take home message here is that the origin of the whole group is in Australia, without a doubt. And it's only recently that we see uh, species turning up in New Caledonia, <coughs> on Lord Howe Island, and in Vanuatu and Fiji. Um, you can go back down the family tree the other way. Uh, it's still Australia. Um, there is some South American components. <coughs> but when you get back to the Cretaceous, when uh, uh, Ni Niolamia uh, was alive, don't forget that Australia and, and uh, uh, South America were still united via Antarctica. So we're seeing a Gondwanan origin for the whole group. Um, you can go even further back down the tree, and that's all South American. So we're talking about a Gondwanan group that after the separation of Australia from Gondwana, which at about 39 million years old, uh, it then becomes an Australian group, and it moves out across the Southwest Pacific subsequent to that. Right. One of the problems I've had in trying to piece together what went on is that there are no models in the literature for reconstructing dispersals. So I've put together this as a, 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 a possible framework of, what, of factors that we need to take into consideration in order to try and reconstruct what went on with this dispersal. Basically, you've, the first thing is the opportunity. Is the species that's going to be dispersed, is it living in the right environments where it's likely to become, um, uh, 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 come, uh, come into contact with waters that will flush it out uh, to sea? And also, does it have the physiological capabilities of withstanding long journeys at sea? What you're going to favour are creatures that are ectothermic. Why don't we see warm-blooded creatures dispersed across the Southwest Pacific that are the same size as our crocodiles and our turtles? We don't see any of the m mammals or marsupials dispersing this way because they are endothermic. They have much higher metabolisms and they can't go for very long without food and water. Whereas ectotherms, cold-blooded creatures, have a low metabolism and therefore they can go much longer without food and water. So the first set of uh, factors are to do with the creatures themselves. It's all about the opportunity in order to be able to disperse. Then there are phylogenetic constraints that we can look to, as I was just showing you, by looking at the family history, by looking at the, the uh, family tree, we can see when different species separated from each other. And that gives us an idea of the timing around the various dispersal events. Um, plate tectonic considerations, because the, uh, the plates have moved and the continents have moved over time, um, are there times in the past when they were in a more optimal position to allow dispersals. Perhaps they were in a position where the dispersal was a shorter distance because the two land masses were closer together, or perhaps the land masses were at a different <coughs> latitude where the currents were favourable to a dispersal. And another set of factors are the oceanographic constraints. What are the minimum distances between the two points of dispersal? And what are the prevailing currents? Will they favour a dispersal in a particular direction? And really what we're looking at is an interplay between all of these factors that will allow us to tease out what actually happened in the past. Um, now there are two modes of dispersal. The first are, flo are, are rafters. And these are creatures, such as our crocodiles, that get caught up on rafts of vegetation or caught up in trees 
that get washed out down a river in a flood and carried out to sea that way. Uh, here we've got a, an American alligator and it's caught up on a raft of trees. Uh, American alligators are obligate freshwater creatures. They, cannot, uh, they can tolerate saltwater conditions, but not for very long. And so if it is on a raft, he's okay. He's not exposed to the saltwater conditions for uh, an ext extended period of time. So there's rafting, and there's also floating, where the creature itself is naturally buoyant in seawater. And that's the case for tortoises. They are naturally buoyant, and they also tend to live in environments where they're likely to get washed out in the flood. So they're living in or near large rivers. Um, also, another factor of rafters which stands in their favours is that it, uh, it tends to favour arboreal species, species that are already living in trees. And you can see what happens. The tree gets knocked down with the creatures in it, washed out the sea, and they raft across. So there's these two modes of dispersal that we need to consider. Um, so let's take rafting for a moment. What do we know about the rafting abilities of terrestrial vertebrates? Not very much. Um, there is this paper which lists all of the creatures, all of the fauna that's been found on rafts uh, mentioned in the scientific literature going back to Oh, I, I don't know what the oldest record is, but it's pretty exhaustive. This is just the list of vertebrates that have been found. Most of the list is invertebrates. And what's of interest to us is when we break that list down, these are all relatively small, uh, uh, mostly arboreal species. Uh, when I say small, less than one kilogram in mass. Um, so then, not of much interest to us apart from the fact that they do, as I said, favour arboreal species uh, and species that live near or in aquatic environments, freshwater aquatic environments. Uh, these two are actually marine turtles that somehow got caught up on rafts of vegetation, and so were included in the uh, survey. But they're of no interest to us, uh, no further in uh, interest to us today. These guys are the only two mammals that were found to be rafting. One is a rabbit, and the other is a rodent. And uh, again, not really instructive for us because they didn't raft very far, and uh, they're Let's, what, what we're interested in are the larger reptiles. And there are two on the list which fit into that category. Constrict, constrictor, boa constrictor, and crocodilus intermedius, the Orinoco crocodile. Let's take the boa constrictor first of all. These guys can get up to 27 kilograms in mass, are known to, get, uh, to exceed 45 kilograms in mass. That's a pretty bloody big snake. Um, the records of these guys being caught up on rafts were when, um, uh, it, it's a bit tricky tying it back into the literature, but it, uh, they turned up, uh, one is a record of this uh, boa constrictor turning up on St. Vincent in the Lesser Achilles, um, and uh, it was big enough to have killed a couple of sheep before it was killed itself. So we're talking about a large snake. It takes a big snake to take down one sheep and to, to, to kill more than one in quick succession is quite a feat. So we are talking about a large boa constrictor um, that was washed out in this case. There is some confusion in the records and it may be referring to exactly the same case but when this snake was killed, it was found to be a female and it was gravid. So it had 
lots of live young in its belly just waiting to get out. And that's the way that, that rafting as a dispersal agent really works. If you've got a gravid female and she makes it across and uh, has her young on the island, you've started a population and off you go. Um, so that, uh, what, what we see is the, um, the records for boa constrictor. Um, it appears that they were washed out of the Orinoco River, which is a major river. So there's a strong plume out into the Atlantic. And the currents uh, in the Atlantic spread like this up into the Caribbean islands. So uh, any boa constrictor on a raft that washed out on the Orinoco River would then be washed up into the uh, Caribbean islands. And that's the two, two cases that we recorded there are uh, in Barbados and Grenada. We also find the boa constrictor on these islands. In Antigua, we only know it as subfossils, so very recent, uh, not fully fossilized material. Uh, and also to the south, it occurs on these islands. They must have got there by rafting, and so uh, even though they haven't been witnessed to do that rafting, it gives you some idea of what's going on. These rafts of vegetation carrying the snakes quite some distances. Uh, and also, there would be a, 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 an amount of island hopping. So you wouldn't, for instance, get to Dom uh, Dominica straight from the Orinoco River. You probably would uh, uh, first you get a, a, a enough washed into Barbados or Granada um, to establish a population there, and then they would get washed uh, uh, along the island chains, populating as they go. Um, let's have a quick look at Crocodilus intermedius, the Orinoco crocodile. This is a large crocodile. It's one of the largest crocodiles in the world. It is entirely constrained to freshwater environments. It cannot survive in salt water. Um, and yeah, typically an ad adults are over 90 kilograms in mass, um, but the world record is 635 kilograms. That is a big crocodile. <laughs> I have sat on a 450 kilogram crocodile, let me tell you that moments like that you find out that the adrenaline's brown. Um, <laughs> so a 635 kilogram crocodile would be absolutely terrifying. Um, and the, the, the sizes to match, you know, going up to over six, almost seven meters in length. Um, the case of this crocodile uh, was from South America down the Orinoco River, where they uh, are normally found, and they washed up in Barbados. Uh, and there was a second uh, sighting of crocodiles in the uh, in Granada, but it didn't, when they found it, there was no raft in sight. So it's assumed that it got over there on a raft and got off the raft, and that's when they found it. Um, so let's have a look, we've had a look at the rafters, and that's virtually all of the literature that there is about rafting large reptiles. Uh, let's have a look at floating tortoises. Um, historically, we know lots of giant tortoises on islands in the Western Indian Ocean, uh, around the Galapagos, uh, Madagascar, um, and today they're just restricted to uh, the the Galapagos Islands have still got some giant turtles, uh, and um, uh, the Aldebra Atoll in uh, the Indian Ocean still has giant tortoises. Um, and uh, many other islands in the, south, in, in the Indian Ocean also had uh, giant tortoises, but they were mostly eaten into extinction by European sailors by about 1840. Um, and how did they get across to where they are? Let's start with the Galapagos turtle, uh, Chelodonis nigra. nigra. Um, these are, again, big beasts, 400 odd kilograms in mass. That's a big tortoise. 
um, found in the Galapagos Islands. When you look at the family tree, the various subspecies of the Galapagos tortoise, the mo mo most recent common, uh, uh, sorry, most recent cousin, the sister group, is a thing called uh, the Chacos tortoise from South America. Now, what's interesting about the Chacos tortoise as an ancestor for, or a, sharing a common ancestor with the Galapagos tortoises, is it's found today on the other side of the Andes Mountains. So what's important is not its current distribution, but the fact that it's on the right landmass to share a common ancestor with the uh, Galapagos tortoises. And so that common ancestor, if it was on the western coast, the, the northwestern coast of South America, if any of them got washed out to sea, they'd be picked up by the Humboldt current, they'd be picked up by this current, they'd join the southern equatorial current, which would take them straight to the Galapagos Islands. That's how they got there. Uh, if we go to the um, uh, Aldebra Atoll uh, for the Aldebra giant tortoise, apparently there's like hundreds of thousands of these guys still alive on the atoll today, and I think that would make a wonderful field trip to go and see these guys. Um, again, they're very large guys, uh, you know, 250 kilograms. That's, a, uh, again, a very large tortoise. Um, the Aldebra Atoll is up here. Um, Tanzania is over here. Here's Madagascar. Uh, again, if we take a look at the phylogenetic systematics, this is the, um, the Aldebra giant tortoise, uh, Aldebra Achilles. Of Gigantia, and its sister group, its closest living relative, is a thing called Astrachiles. And that is a small turtle, only eight and a half kilograms, so it's, it's, it's a decent meal. Um, but it's a small turtle from Madagascar. Today it's only found in these little populations there. It's a highly endangered species. But again, what's important is that the common ancestor of the Aldebra tortoise and this guy would have been on Madagascar. Um, there's also, when we talk about uh, this, the Indian Ocean, there are the historical uh, creatures, principally uh, on Reunion, Mauritius and Rodriguez Islands. We know from preserved specimens, we are able to do the family histories of these guys and you will not be surprised to know that the most common, uh, the most recent common ancestor, or the, the closest living group to these guys from Mauritius, um, Reunion and Rodriguez, are our guys over in Aldebra and in Madagascar. So what's going on there is these are the prevailing currents. And if those, the, the ancestral tortoise is living on this part, only that part of the coast, and gets washed out to sea, it will be picked up and moved around in this tire. Anywhere else in Madagascar, it gets washed in the wrong direction. And the areas in yellow are areas that would have been exposed as land in the last ice age. If you drop sea levels by 50 to 100 metres, there's the extra areas of land. So that it's a long stretch to think that um, some poor little tortoise in one go went right the way around the Gaia and ended up down here in Rodriguez, Mauritius uh, and Reunion. Probably what's happened is they get washed up into these atolls here in Elbra, then they get moved over to these, uh, then they can get moved down here, they can get moved around here. You can see that by having those intermediate stops, we break what seems to be an impossibly long journey into several small stopovers. Okay. Um, there has only been one case 
where a turtle has been observed, or a tortoise has been observed to have floated from one point to another. And it occurred in 2004 when a, one of the giant tortoises uh, from uh, Aldebra Atoll washed up in Tanzania 740 kilometres away. And that's in a straight line. And it's unlikely that the currents would have taken it in a straight line. So however long it's spent at sea is anyone's guess. But it was alive, it was in pretty bad shape, but it survived and it lived, uh, as far as I know, it's still alive today. So that gives us some baseline. That's all the data that we've got to understand what sort of distances a floating turtle can tolerate. Um, so with that really sketchy understanding of floating and rafting abilities for larger reptiles, the factors that seem to be important are, are you ectothermic, so you've got a low metabolic rate? Um, are you arboreal, that would favour you rafting? Or are you a floater? Are you a species that naturally floats? So let's have a look at our uh, myelania. That ticks two of those boxes. So that's probably how um, uh, it, it got across was, uh, as a floater. Mikasuchus, well, it ticks the ectothermic box. These are cold blooded creatures. I have argued for a long time that Mycosuchus is actually an arboreal crocodile. It's a tree climbing crocodile. And every time I've produced this at a conference, people say I'm mad. <laughs> I present to you the evidence upon which this rather wild accusation is based. If you have a look at the skull, the humerus, and the tibia of a typical crocodile, that's what they look like. <coughs> if we put in the skull, the humerus, and the tibia of Mycosuchus, you can see they're radically different. The head is short and box-like, not like a crocodile, the typical crocodile. The humerus has large um, uh, turbicles, and these are where muscles attach. It suggests that it's doing something really powerful with its arms. And its tibia, or shin bone, is somewhat elongate. If you put, compare those to a goanna, they have short box like heads, they have hypertrophied muscle attachments, and they have elongate tibias. And what are goannas doing? They're climbing trees. And at the time that Mycosuchus was running around the rainforests of Riversley, there were no goannas in Australia. That niche was available to whoever wanted to take it on. And I say, Miko Sukas took that on. It was effectively a crocodilian goanna. So I contend that Miko Sukas is an arboreal species, and that's why it was favoured for a rafting event. Okay. Now, Another consideration is the distances involved. Uh, we know that the boa constrictor and the Orinoco crocodile went from or the Orinoco Delta to Granada, that's 360 kilometres. We know that they also uh, went from the Orinoco, uh, Orinoco Delta to Barbados, that's 513 kilometres. We know that the Aldebra tortoise, the floater, completed a journey of 740 kilometres. Australia to Lord Howe Island is only 586 kilometres. So to float a turtle across there shouldn't be a problem. But the distance from Australia to New Caledonia is 14,027 kilometres. So where, although we can't from this data say what's the maximum distance that you can raft or float a, a, a large reptile, I think you're starting to put, uh, stretch credibility 
to suggest that it's more than twice or around twice the large, longest observed floating event. Um, so, what can we do to mitigate those factors and make the distance between New Caledonia and Australia shorter? And also, we have the problem that the currents today will favour getting to Lord Howe Island. This is the, um, the subtropical uh, cow current and it flows from west to east. So that's a no-brainer, getting to Lord Howe Island. But when you get up into the latitudes of New Caledonia, the currents go in the opposite direction. You cannot raft or float from Australia to New Caledonia today. How do we get around those problems? Let's have a look at the plate tectonics, the, the seafloor structure as it is today, and then we can start delving back into the past to see what's changed. The th takeaway message is here, forget about Fiji and Vanuatu, then they're <coughs> now irrelevant to this story. What we're interested in is uh, the, re the relationships of the land masses over here. And that was all established about 45, 50 million years ago. So long before we're talking about our crocodiles and turtles making the trip from Australia to New Caledonia, they were set in pretty much the configuration that they are today. So it's always been, for the last 40 odd million years, it's always been 1,400 kilometres from Australia to New Caledonia. Um, but some key features to notice here, there are two rows of volcanoes here. This is called the Tasmanid um, uh, Volcanic Chain, and this is the Lord Howe Island Rise. And these are what are called hotspot chains. You have a plume of magma under the earth coming up, and it punches through the crust and forms a volcano. And as the crust moves across the plume, that volcano becomes extinct and a new one forms. And that one becomes extinct and a new one forms. And so these two chains record the movement of the Australian plate north. So the youngest are down here, the Lord Howe Island is down here, um, and the oldest in those two chains is back here. And they go back about 30 million years. The other feature that I want you to pay attention to is this chunk of seafloor here, which is actually continental crust. It's a submerged continent, which unfortunately is called Zealandia. But this side of the ditch we refer to it as Tasmanica. <laughs> um, and we've got, uh, as I'll go into a little more detail in just a moment, there is good evidence that portions of this have been emerging in the past. So we can start to think about breaking the distance up from Australia to New Caledonia into a series of island hops. Now, this, if, if we go back in time, so this is the configuration on the present day. We go back 10 million years, and I've adjusted these maps so that the 33rd parallel, uh, sorry, the 33rd latitude, um, will uh, line up. And you can see that what's happened over the last 10 million years is this has all moved north. It's rotated slightly, but it's all moved north. Vanuatu's way off over here, up with Fiji. It's, it's right mess. Just forget about Vanuatu and Fiji. I'm not interested in them. If you go back another 10 million years, everything's further south still. Now, remember I said those island arc chains, they're oldest at the top. When they're active, that's when they're at their highest. As time goes by and they cease to have um, magma infused in them because they, the plates moved on, they gradually start to sink. So, the northern islands of those two island arc chains the further back in time you go, were more likely to be emergent. 
above the sea level. Talking about sea levels, what's happened to those over the last 10, 20 million years? Um, over the last 9 million years, during the ice ages, we had sea levels dropping down to more than 100 metres below what they are today. And they did that a number of times. Don't forget, we're not talking about an ice age. There's something like 12 different ice ages over the last 2 million years. So sea levels have dropped by up to uh, 120 metres on several occasions over the last 2 million years. But as you go back in time, the amount of variation in sea level decreases and it tends to come back to pretty much an average of what it is today. So the further back in time you go, you can't really rely on sea level lowering uh, to assist you by exposing uh, areas of, of land. Um, and if you go back even further, so that is this portion of the graph, and if you go back even further, you can see that it tends to stabilise out around about the current range of sea levels that we have today and that we've experienced for the last 10,000 years or so. Okay, let's bring this all together. So, here is a map of the Southwest Pacific as it is today. And what I've done is the light white areas are a 50 metre contour level, minus 50 metres, uh, and the pale blue, minus 100. So, in an ice age, and uh, the last time that the sea levels were 100 metres down, it was only about 26,000 years ago. 26,000 years ago, these would all have been land. So there's the two island arcs there, there's a portion of Zealandia there. New Caledonia wouldn't have been larger than it is today. Uh, forget about them. But Australia <coughs> extends a long way out. Um, one of the things I'm really keen about is one of the islands up here is Willis Island. Didn't know that until I started doing this research. Okay, how do we know which of those island arc chains, uh, island arc mounts, had been emergent at some time in the past? You delve into the literature and it won't tell you. They have gone out and they put buckets down and dredged up rock samples from the tops of all of these things and they talk about what rocks are there and they talk about what animals are living there today. They have no idea if or when they were emergent. But thanks to Google Maps, when you look at those areas today, you can see that some of these islands have a flat top. That means that sometime in the past they had to have been emergent. And as they sank, corals grew up and gave them that flat top. Whereas islands or seamounts like this, which have a point, were never emergent. So we can rule these pointy ones out as being any use to us, and we'll just take the flat top ones as being emergent at some time in the past. We don't know when, but sometime in the past. Not only are we talking about the two island arcs, but also this portion of Zealandia. Okay, so now we're cooking with crumbles. Now we are talking about reducing the distances, but we still have a problem. Let's take it back 10 million years, and so because we're talk, uh, back in, a, in an era where you don't have that drop in sea levels, let's take away all, all the extra stuff around New Caledonia and uh, Australia. But we will leave in the fact that the, these islands were emergent at some stage. Take it back another 10 million years, and uh, everything has just shifted further south. Now let's add in the current information. Because roughly, and this is 
very much a bucket sense. The currents going from west to east, the, so, the subtropical uh, counter current, is determined pretty much by latitude. There are other factors, but pretty much by latitude. So we can assume that it probably hasn't varied a lot in latitude over time. And similarly, the currents to the north, which flow in the other direction, are also determined by latitude, and they probably haven't changed in latitude over time. So over time, this has moved through the different currents. If you go back 20 million years, these become viable pathways for dispersal from Australia across to the island rises, Zealandia, onto New Caledonia, and even out to the islands in, uh, in the Admiralty Group. Because the currents are all in your favour 20 million years ago. You come up to 10 million years ago, and while you've still got some routes of dispersal that are viable, and that can theoretically get you to New Caledonia, the northern routes that were available 10, uh, 20 million years ago become suspicious. There's this transition zone where the current could be in either direction, and it's less likely that you're going to be able to use uh, those dispersal routes at that time. Come to today, or the present, and the viable dispersal routes are highly questionable that you could even get to the Lord Howe Island Rise. Unlikely that you could go any further from the Lord Howe Island Rise anyway. But you do favour going from Australia to Lord, uh, Lord Howe Island. And so that would explain the distribution of myelania platyceps on Lord Howe Island. What this says is that the dispersal of myelania and mycosuchus to New Caledonia is more likely the further back in time we go. And when we look at those family trees, we're looking at separation dates of uh, 15, 20 million years. So it's quite a viable length of time to go back to look at when these dispersals were likely to have occurred. Certainly, prior to 10 million years ago, everything's hunky-dory to get to New Caledonia by uh, floating or rafting. It's unlikely to be a more recent event, like, unlikely to be within the last uh, 10 million years. No one, so far, has come up with that conclusion. So I'm presenting with you, uh, you with science hot off the press, ladies and gentlemen. You are the first audience to experience this. Um, so, and there is a sting in the tail. I was thrilled when I was able to put those maps together. Finally, I made sense of how you get these guys across the South Pacific. Um, a, uh, and uh, while I can get them to Lord Howe Island and New Caledonia, um, we've seen that um, human agents in much more recent times can get them across to Vanuatu and Fiji. Everything's hunky-dory. We understand everything. But there is the Volia problem. That is the crocodile in Fiji. We know it's related to Mikosuchus. It must have come from Australia somehow, and I cannot figure out how, because the currents are always in the wrong direction. And unlike the turtles, uh, the, the myelanium material in Fiji, which is only found in middens, the crocodile material in Fiji is only found in cave deposits. They are natural deposits. Maybe they were taken there by people and they got loose. Unlikely. If you're going to go to that effort of carrying crocodile on board your ship as a potential food supply, you're not going to let it run away when you get to Fiji. 
Um, so really, the Volia problem is the sting in the tail. I cannot make sense of uh, Volia. But I've solved 95% of the problem. <laughs> and 95% uh, in science means that uh, it's as good as proven. So I'm quite happy with that. I, of, uh, I owe you guys a debt of gratitude for encouraging me to dig into this problem. Uh, uh, if I had uh, continued on my own lackadaisical ways, it would probably be another 30 years before I would turn around and uh, start to investigate this and realise that there was some really fundamental and interesting problems to overcome and understand and come to terms with. So thank you very much for making me do the thinking. I hope that what I've presented to you makes some kind of sense, and I'm only too happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs>